here's what we're doing. This is kind of like the Roman series, if you remember climbing the mountain at the start of last summer. We need to lay out the whole sermon series for you. We don't want there to be confusion. We want everybody on the same page, walking away, being able to say the same things, right? As we introduce this sermon series, I just want to acknowledge that a lot of people don't like it when churches ask for money, right? Like, we don't like it. It makes us feel uncomfortable. I can already feel it in the air. But here's what. Here's what we've got to understand. When it comes to the subject of money in the church, it's on the one hand, but on the other. On the one hand, should a church ever use guilt, manipulation, or shame to motivate you to give? What do you think? Say no. First Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, elders are not to be domineering. No, we reject that. That's not what we're doing. You will not get one hint of that coming off of us. But on the other hand, on the other hand, is it biblical for a church to do this? Is it biblical? What do you think? I would ask you to go to the book of Haggai, one of the most underread books in all of the Bible, where God talks to his people and says, you're building fancy wood panel homes for yourself, and you're not building my house. You're not building the local church. God addresses it to the people of Israel. Walking over to the New Testament, walking over to the New Testament, you find Jesus talking to the rich young ruler in front of other people saying, hey, go sell all your possessions. Let's put that Bible into practice. You see Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9 telling them, hey, we need you to give. I've already sent guys ahead of me to give. It's in the Bible. We see preachers preaching on this subject. We see their letters being read on this subject in worship services. Have anybody heard of the book of Philemon? With Jude, probably one of the two most underread books in all of the New Testament. Do you know, do you know what the book of Philemon is? Let me summarize it for you. Philemon, hey, it's Paul. Remember me? I'm the guy who led you to faith in Jesus. Hey, good news. Your slave ran away. We led him to faith in Jesus. And guess what? Boy, howdy, is he good at ministry. I kind of need him. <laughs> By the way, do you remember that time I led you to Jesus? Well, hey, Philemon, I could command you, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to ask you to give him to me, part of your treasure. By the way, do you remember that time I led you to faith in Jesus? Just saying. Just saying. Hey, no pressure, I'm sure you'll do the right thing. Love, Paul, peace out. That's the book of Philemon. Does the church address these things? Yes. So can we go right at it? Kind of. Why? Because even though there's this on the one hand, on the other, we want you to take that and wipe it off the table because this is not a sermon series about money. This is not even a sermon series about a building. We miss so much if we miss that point. Our God is a God of multiplication. His goal for humanity is to multiply us. His goal for creation is to multiply us. And going deep with that truth is what we are about in that sermon series, in this sermon series. Let me just remind you of what we read in the Old and New Testament. On day three of creation, God created plants. And it doesn't just say plants. It adds the detail of seed-bearing plants. Why? He's a God of multiplication. On day five of creation, when he creates the water critters, he tells them, be fruitful and multiply. On day six, when he creates man, he tells us, be fruitful and multiply, multiply. Our God has a goal in creation, and that goal is multiplication. Moreover, we saw in the New Testament, in Revelation chapter 7, we see what our God is up to in the now, and we see a snapshot of what it might even look like in the future. Not what it might, what it will look like in the future when he's done multiplying and there is a multitude praising him around his throne, joining in with the saints who are already in heaven as a multitude. That's your eternal destiny. Is it safe to say that your God is the God who multiplies. That's what we're going deep with. That's what we're about. That's what this sermon series, that's what this campaign is about. That's why we named it Grace Multiplies, because multiplication might as well be the family business that we were adopted into. Grace, I hope you already see, this isn't about money. This is about a deeper understanding of our God and a side of him that gets rather underpreached. 
This is about you and me being better image bearers, better brothers and sisters to King Jesus, better servants of him. This is about a deeper commitment to our father's family business. When you look at, the, when you look at this truth, that he's a God who has a goal of multiplication, and when you realize that and not the American dream is the dominant storyline of our lives, come with me for a minute. Yes, the storyline of the Bible is better than the American dream. And take that from someone who has fought and killed and shot at and given orders to drop bombs to protect the American dream. It's good, but it ain't God. Friends, we need a deeper, better storyline. There's a world of people that need a deeper, better storyline. And getting at that is what this is about. That's why we called it Grace Multiplies, because he's a God who multiplies. That's the why we named it. But let's ask. Okay, we know why we named it Grace Multiplies. We know what we're getting at. What is the what? What does it even mean to multiply? You ask seven people, you might get eight different definitions of multiply. Let's go to the Bible. Let's go to the Bible and let's ask, what does multiply even mean? As we go to the Old Testament, synonyms for multiply are phrases like prosper, increase, not just physically, but spiritually. We're not a prosperity gospel church. Do not hear what I am not saying. We ain't about that. No, not at all. But as we go to the New Testament, it's about fullness. It's about abundant life. It's about his love multiplying in us. That's what multiplication means. In fact, if I could give you a concise biblical definition of multiply, it would be this. Let's bring it up. What do we mean by multiply? We mean by increasing God's various blessings in my life, in your life, in the life of the people around you, and the life of the people out there who don't know Jesus. That is what we are about in this campaign. There's the why, there's the what. How does God work multiplication? Two answers for you. Two answers for you, then I promise you we'll get to the sermon. How does our God work multiplication? Two answers. First, he multiplies his grace in us to create more faith, more trust in him. He works internally in us. Let me show you this from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 19. Let's bring that up. Do you see Paul's prayer? Do you see... Paul's prayer. Is that up? Is that a white screen? Let's go to the next slide. We're multiplying that slide for you. There we go. All right. His blessings multiply in us. Paul's prayer for the Ephesians is that they would know the full volume of God's dwelling with them, fullness in God, and more and more of God's love. How do you calculate volume? Length times width times height. That's what you get in this text. Paul wants them to know the multiplication of God's love in their lives. That's the first way. His grace multiplies in us. What's the second way that his grace multiplies? If the first way is internally, then the second way is externally. Let's look at that. This is Numbers chapter 14, verse 21. This is Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 14. Our God is in the business of multiplying his glory. He's in the business of multiplying his name and making it great all across the face of the earth so that it even covers the waters of the Pacific Ocean. There is an external aspect to how our God multiplies. In fact, this second way is our original God-given task in the garden. That's the why behind those words. Be fruitful and multiply to fill the earth with people who will reflect his glory as image bearers. Do you see this? Do you see this? We gotta see this. We gotta get this right, right? Like we should crave more of God's own glory in our lives. We should crave for God's glory to be made known. We should crave for his glory to push out other false sources of blessing that we look to so that we are delighting and satisfied in him and in him alone. We should want that for other people. Grace, do you see what this sermon series is about? With that in mind, now, now, let's go to the text. You know, over the next five weeks, we're answering the question, what does it mean 
to be an agent of multiplication. What does it mean to be an agent of multiplication? And today's answer is this. It means to follow him. So today's question as we come to this sermon is this. The question is this. To multiply, what does it look like to follow our God? 